Wow, it's great to be here today. It's great to be following such a distinguished panel with so much connection with what I want to talk with you all about today. Uh, I'm Brian Bellendorf. As Nori mentioned, I'm CTO for the Open Wallet Foundation. I've been with the Linux Foundation, which is the home for the Open Wallet Foundation, for eight years now, leading initiatives such as Hyperledger, the Open Source Security Foundation. Uh, I've been focusing on digital identity for the last year because this is a really important domain. And while many of the, much of the world is focused on artificial intelligence or cloud and, and other interesting things, there's a quiet revolution happening in ID that I want you all to know about. So we know about systems for digital ID like Aadhaar, uh, which was mentioned uh, in the previous panel, uh, or perhaps various uh, other centralized digital ID systems. But let's take a step back and think about in the real world, what's in your wallet, as they say. Right? What's in your wallet or your purse or your backpack or perhaps in your filing cabinet at home? Uh, your important documents that you know, mean something to you that are your accomplishments, your role in life, you know, your birth certificate perhaps. But let's think about this big picture. Obviously we have things that are payment methods like credit cards. We have cash, you know, uh, or, and in the digital form that looks like cryptocurrencies, perhaps. We have government documents like driver's licenses and national identity cards, uh, that sort of thing. You might even have membership cards, loyalty cards. You're a part of a union or uh, a member of a zoo or a, a patron of the arts in some way. Um, of course, uh, in a digital sphere, we might also have pass keys and passwords. Um, uh, and certainly you have badges you might use to get into work, right? Uh, but let's also think broadly here. Uh, when you get a prescription from a doctor uh, that you take to a pharmacy, this is a form of a document that is very personal, very specific to you, but it has to be trusted by the person you present it to. Likewise with insurance cards, uh, likewise with perhaps even concert tickets and airline tickets. Think about, and now, now also think about all of these kinds of very personal kind of uh, close-in data but things that you might manage on the behalf of your parents. If you have elderly parents who need help sometimes dealing with the healthcare system or the government, you're probably managing documents like this on their behalf. You might be managing documents like this for your children or, or, or others, right? So, so think of this as kind of the opposite of big data. Um, and uh, in, in these documents, there's too many of these to hope to ever have one cloud server or one account to hold them. Of course, many of you, I'm sure, use Apple accounts and Google accounts and other things to access lots of places and store lots of things, but maybe there's a different approach. Maybe there's an approach that looks actually a lot like open source software, where you, you pull down open source code, you use it, and you deploy it somewhere else. You as the developer are this pivot point. Well, what if we took that approach to thinking about digital identity, where you have issuers of these kinds of documents, they hand them to you, the holder of these documents, and then you can present them to somebody who will verify them. And ideally, the connection between issuer and verifier is in the form of a shared trust framework, uh, not requiring a direct connection to a central database, but instead a way for them to validate that this is a valid credential uh, uh, and, and know that they can trust it in a certain context. So uh, this has been the work of uh, a community, uh, uh, many communities actually working on standards in this domain, working on uh, 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 you know, the kind of software to support this, and all of this is coming together in, in a really interesting way. But before we dive in too much, we have to make sure that as we build this technology, it is private, it is secure, and it is safe. And what do we mean by that, right? We mean safety in the, in the form of, you know, the wallet has to look out for the interests of its user in the same way that a web browser looks out for your interests, right? When you go and visit a secure website and you see the little green bar that indicates, you know, the, the connection is encrypted, uh, or if it's not encrypted, the big warning sign, that's the web browser looking out for your behalf. 
Likewise, wallets, right? They need to tell you which credentials you have that are valid and when they can be trusted and used. Um, but we should also avoid calling back to the issuer when you use them somewhere so that the issuer doesn't get to create a trail of where you use this credential. We should probably also avoid something that, you know, we inadvertently created a problem with cookies where if I present, uh, 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 if I go and visit two websites and they use the same, you know, small little embedded image, then uh, somebody gets to know that I visited multiple sites, build a history of me. Well, let's avoid that scenario when we're talking about verifiable credentials as well. Um, uh, lots of other things that wallets can do to provide this degree of safety. In fact, this is something at the Open Wallet Foundation. We've pulled together a special interest group to develop a document to describe what does wallet safety mean. Um, but there's, it boils down to security, privacy, safety, and freedom of choice as well. And I mentioned the web browser as the metaphor because in many ways, this should work like the web. So what do we mean by working uh, like the web? Well, today, uh, the wallets that are provided by the platforms you're on, Google Wallet or Apple Pay, uh, are very specific to those services. Uh, and they're specific to perhaps the payment rails or credential types you might use. Cryptocurrency wallets are the same thing. You know, your Coinbase wallet is very attached to Coinbase, the exchange service, for example. Um, they're also very closely connected to your ID on your phone, which makes it hard to manage these documents documents on behalf of other people. Uh, and so it can get complicated very quickly. Where we want to get to, uh, many people believe, uh, is a world where there are, uh, where you have a choice of wallets. You can use the platform ones, you could use third party wallets, you probably will see nation states offer wallets. In fact, this is a goal for, for things, and I'll, I'll mention this in a bit. But users should be able to choose where, which wallets they use and, and move credentials from one wallet to another so that we have a healthy competitive ecosystem in this domain. You should also be able to choose where do I back up these credentials? Who is my custodian for holding these things? And why is this important? Well, you know, I like to talk to people about what is your favorite dystopia? Like, what is is the future, the dark future, you're trying to avoid? Some people will say the matrix. <laughs> Some people will say 1984, you know. Um, my personal dystopia is uh, characterized by a movie that came out in the 80s called Brazil. Uh, does anyone know this movie? Uh, it's great. Um, it's a kind of a cult classic, as they say, but the movie is kind of about a world where the bureaucracy has run amok. It has gone crazy, and in, it is very difficult for an average person to navigate society. In fact, the, uh, one of the characters dies in a torrent of paperwork, literal paperwork. Um, and often, at least in the, sta the United States, it can feel this way, but I know people feel this in other countries, you're lost in the bureaucracy. You're dealing with government permits, you're dealing with businesses that ask you to reset your password constantly. Uh, uh, and it can, that complexity derives from the fact that often we don't have human agency in our engagement engagement with digital systems. And, and if we get this right with wallets, we can reestablish that. We can establish consumers uh, as kind of the pivot point between financial institutions when they want to open a bank account. Uh, I, the, it, the KYC processes, know your customer processes, could be optimized by saying, here's my proof that I work for this company. Here's my proof uh, that I pay my taxes. <laughs> here's my proof of my you know, educational background. Without waiting for the bank to have to clear a bunch of things behind the scenes or check a credit record that might not be correct. Correct. You could also put citizens at the center of their engagement with government, right? If you are opening a business, probably you're dealing with many levels of government. Uh, let's say it's a restaurant and you want to serve alcohol, you're probably dealing with other agencies. Well, you as the business owner uh, or you as the citizen should be the pivot point for exchanging these important documents that allow you to get the permits to be legal and, and do the right thing without waiting for all those government agencies to integrate behind the scenes. Um, think about this in a healthcare context too. I mentioned prescriptions. Well, think about other health data about you 
that comes from one doctor that you want to present to a pharmacy or to another doctor or a specialist, and they need to be able to validate and have high trust that those documents are from who they say they're from. Um, and it, when you're applying for a job, being able to show your, your history is more than just your LinkedIn history where anybody can make up that they graduated from an important school, uh, and instead show your digital diploma, uh, uh, your other digital educational credentials is super important. Um, if we get this right, consumer rights can be protected and human agency can be established. Um, and, I, and I think we'll also see wallets that will specialize in these different domains. So current progress towards this uh, kind of future has been uh, really rapid recently. Um, we're seeing the file formats for verifiable credentials really solidify through the work of the uh, World Wide Web Consortium, as well as uh, at, at ISO through document formats like MDLs, MDOCs, and most importantly, something called SDJOT for selective disclosure, being able to show that you know I'm over the age of 18 without having to tell you my birth date, an important thing. Uh, we're seeing the presentation protocols kind of solidify and the cryptography basics get uh, in place for the privacy preservation. Um, we're also, uh, you know, some of the major drivers that led us to now include the, the, the pandemic, uh, where proof of vaccination status became a very high priority for governments around the world, and it helped uh, harden a lot of the standards in this domain. Um, uh, and in Europe, there's a very interesting project called the European Union Digital Identity Initiative, EUDI. And the EUDI is a mandate from the European Commission to its member states to start issuing verifiable credentials for your national ID, for your driver's license, for educational accomplishments, and they have several large-scale pilots already underway. Um, those countries will also have to issue wallets to hold these credentials to help bootstrap this more uh, wider uh, kind of choice environment for wallets out there. But in the United States, we see the Department of Homeland Security uh, doing pilots with this technology. In Bhutan, the National Digital Identity uh, Project has now issued uh, uh, digital passports to uh, digital identity cards to 20% of their population. And MIT uh, is pushing forward with a digital credentials project um, uh, where they uh, are issuing uh, uh, diplomas as digital documents. In Canada, there's a big project. Uh, in, uh, and it actually, a successor to the Aadhaar system, uh, a project uh, put together called MOSIP, is also building a verifiable credential wallet to hold these things as the next step beyond just digital identity, uh, as, as, as we've known through Aadhaar. And all of these efforts we're working with uh, at the Open Wallet Foundation. The Open Wallet Foundation, we've been in operation for just over a year. We're a consortium uh, of companies, as many Linux Foundation projects are, building a home for open source software that are components and toolkits, and in some cases, everything you need to build a wallet to be able to support this kind of decentralized identity future. Um, of course, we are, like every Linux Foundation project, 100% open source, 100% uh, uh, open in our development processes. We have an open door for contributors from everywhere. We are looking for the bits and pieces that make up these wallets, which there's quite a few of them. I won't go through this whole list. Uh, many of you who have built you know, key recovery systems and digital identity systems know that this is, it's very hard to make this complex space simple for the end user. But just as making a web browser great for the end user was important to building the web, making a great wallet environment for end users is really important as well. And hiding a lot of the complexity and, and achieving that degree of safety, security, uh, and, and privacy for the individual. Our projects go through a project life cycle uh, like many Linux Foundation projects do. Uh, I, we have an open door to, to, we really want to house all the different technologies efforts that are out there. I mentioned you know, MIT, I mentioned MOSIP, uh, I, I mentioned Bhutan. You know, we are bringing those, uh, the, inviting those communities and we've brought many of those projects under one roof to be able to build a set of projects that, that will help people building wallets move further and faster and really try to integrate them together. We have five projects that have achieved a degree of, of uh, adoption out there and uh, 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 collaboration contribution from others. Uh, I won't go into detail on these, but many of them are being used, such as Credo in uh, the European Union Digital Identity Initiative already. Uh, there's also code contributed, interestingly enough, from Google themselves for verification.
verifiable credentials that has ended up in the European Union's reference implementation. Uh, and so uh, in addition to those five, we have uh, uh, about 15 additional projects that are little bits and pieces to assembling wallets. At the end of the day, um, and I, I wish I had more time to go into depth, but trust me, they're, they're all interesting. Um, what we want to see happen at the Open Wallet Foundation, and we've made a lot of progress on this front, is to put these different pieces together into one or more stacks that then a country or a company or a nonprofit or a union or somebody would put into, would compile, put into an app and then submit into an app store with the terms of service and deliver to end users, right? And all these wallets, if we succeed, will be interoperable uh, uh, and the majority of that code will be shared. Uh, very quickly, we are supported by a terrific cast of organizations, uh, including Google themselves, <laughs> Visa, Accenture, com uh, companies based around the world, including NTT Digital here in Japan, who we're very appreciative of. We also have members of, of governments from around the world uh, in an entity we used to call the Government Advisory Council, but now we have just launched this new thing as a companion to the Open Wallet Foundation called the Open Wallet Forum. And we're doing this in partnership with the ITU uh, at the United Nations, which will convene the government technologists around the world uh, to map the landscape of wallet-related technologies and look for gaps, look for overlap, look for ways to drive cross-border use cases, and really to drive interoperability across, uh, across the world for these technologies. And we're very grateful that Japan, South Korea, Switzerland, and a nonprofit called Code develop have signed up to support this effort as a companion to the Open Wallet Foundation. Think of this as left brain and right brain, and together with that, we'll create the distributed identity and digital wallet future. Thank you very much. Thank you.